Yeah, no, I, I appreciate everybody coming on today. Um, you know, I'd like I'd like to just start by by thanking Dan Held and, and Derek Simmons uh, the, the work they did this weekend. Um, for those that are that are, that are unaware, <clears throat> uh, both Denton Segerman and Justin Parker tested positive late in the week uh, for COVID. So Dan and Derek uh, were were thrust into to managing the the entire weekend along with Josh Turnock. Um, they they did a, did a great job stepping up like yeah, like you knew that they would uh, managed it really well. A tough situation. They got the kids did a really good job managing um, some of the chaos and, and were able to go out and, and, and have a successful weekend. So I just wanted to thank Dan and Derek and, and Josh as well for, for stepping in and, and doing a terrific job. <clears throat> All right. First question will go to Tom Brew. Hey, Coach. Uh, glad to see you back, too. And hopefully the other guys will get back quickly as well. Mm -hmm. um, one question I had today. Um, uh, Kip has uh, seen a lot, you know, seen some action here in, in the last little bit. Is he one of those uh, freshmen that's going to be kind of hard to keep off the field now here going forward? Yeah, I, I thought Kip did a really nice job uh, this past weekend. The thing I, that, that impressed me the most about Kip over the, the last several weeks is when, when you watch a young guy, the way that he reacts after watching baseball that he hasn't played at before, that level he hasn't played at before. So, Watching him from before Minnesota to after Minnesota, he didn't play. But watching the way that he changed uh, his uh, his swing, his, it's kind of the way that he approached offense after seeing offense played at a higher level, seeing pitching at a high level, was really impressive to me. Um, and it was an indication of, of a really intelligent uh, young man that, that also is obviously physically gifted. The guys that you look at the young, the freshmen that impact the program early, they're, they're smart. Obviously, they're talented, but they're smart, and they they apply what they learn quickly. And that was the thing that I thought with Kip. After that weekend, obviously, then I got COVID and wasn't there for a week or, or for two weeks. Uh, but going into this past weekend, uh, the, the staff and I kind of behind the scenes talking about Kip as a potential option, really kind of wanted to get him in there, get his feet wet. And then he stepped in and, and did a really nice job. And, uh, yeah, he, he'll continue to be a guy that, that we look at as a, as a rotational piece. And if he earns an everyday job, he earns an everyday job. But uh, I, I think you look at his progression and, again, this, the, the, the ability to apply in real time, uh, what you're seeing and learning is, is a separator for, for, for all good players. And, and Kip's, I think, is going to be a good player this year. He's going to be a really good player here at Indiana and, and, and into the future. And, and that, that time may also be right now. And if I could just follow up real quickly, how long did it take you to learn how to pronounce futures? Uh, <laughs> I had to get the, the, the actual pronunciation. I asked Kip several times. I just called him Kip. You know, you call a lot of kids by their last name because you have multiple, you know, multiple first names and you just get used to kind of calling by his last name. And I, I wouldn't call him by his last name. So I had to, I had to uh, make sure his pronunciation, it, it took a little time, but uh, I, I got it now. I got it now. <laughs> Austin and then Carl. Along the lines of, of freshmen who have stepped up early, what has allowed Paul Tates to make such an incredible impact so early in his Hoosier career? He's, he's tough mentally, which I know is cliche, but, but in, in sports at this level, especially baseball, you, you, have, to, you have to have uh, a spine. You have to have a stiff spine. You, you got to be able to handle – the, the success and also the failure. And that's where most most guys, young guys can't handle it. They, they can't handle the, the ups and the downs of, of the sport at this level. And Paul's really tough mentally um, and he's really smart. They're all talented. They can't play at this level if they're not talented. So when they get here, they're physically good enough. And so the rest of it becomes, are they tough enough to handle the moment of the ups and the downs? And then over the course of their career, they get better at it. And then are they, are they smart enough to be able to apply what they're learning in real time? Like right now, you make a mistake. Does it take, does it take a week to rectify that? Does it take a month to rectify? Does it take a year to fix that? Paul's a guy that, that you, can, you can see him learning it in the middle of a game. You'll see him make a mistake, and it's like he doesn't do the same thing two and three and four times. Uh, and so you, you combine those things, and for Paul especially, it's like he's a tough kid who's intelligent and he applies in real time what he's learning and that allows him to, to continue to, to improve. And he's still going to make mistakes like they all are, uh, like, like the best players do. Um, but for a young guy like him, th th those are the two factors that, that have allowed him to really improve quickly and, 
and be a, uh, an impactful player. And one that <clears throat> you, you looked at, we talked about Paul before the season when guys would ask about young guys. It's like, I just, you trust Paul because of the, the, those same characteristics you saw throughout the year. Carl and then John. Coach, uh, good to see you again. Um, uh, Jeremy Houston you know, was a junior when you when you first uh, came 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 on, and at that point he was already very good at uh, seeing lots of pitches. That was a skill that he had before you got your hands on him. Uh, but you know, lately he has shown a really good skill. In fact, you know, one of his big hits was off of a uh, was a two strike off of a off speed pitch. Can you talk about his development since uh, you've had your your time with him? Absolutely. I think, and actually it's funny you mentioned that because Jeremy and I had a, had a conversation yesterday in, in a small group setting. And I asked Jeremy about, to talk to some of the other young guys about his his growth throughout his career and what he's learned in, in some of the different pieces. And one of the things that he talked about in the last you know, the last two or three years for him was the, the way that he talks to himself, like his personal self-talk, his self-dialogue, um, and the difference in the early in his career and then later in his career. And I think that's something that gets <clears throat> overlooked tremendously is how we, how we communicate to ourself, uh, how we talk to ourselves in the moment of, of, of competition. And so we can, you can look at Jeremy and, and his swing is different and, and he's, he's worked on his swing and he really has uh, worked hard to be a better offensive player in, in many ways. Um, but you, you see the difference in a guy that like th this past weekend, you know, bases loaded in two outs and, and we didn't drive a run in earlier in the inning um, and Jeremy comes up and that's, that's a moment that, uh, you know, it, it's a difficult moment. You have to really be able to handle that mentally to go in and have success there. And you watch Jeremy compete through that at bat. He gets to a full count. He gets a pitch out over the plate and he stings it for two RBIs and, in talking to him about the, the difference in his mindset. It's like, I believe I'm capable of having success in those moments when I don't know that I always believed I was capable of having success, or at least I didn't talk to myself in a way that allowed me to consistently go out and succeed. So uh, I, I know that's, that's a little bit of an odd response, but I think the, the way that, that he values himself, that he values the work that he's put in, um, and that he believes he's capable of truly having success on a consistent basis because of the work that is put in, um, I think allows him to go out there and, and, and perform well. The, 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 the process is the only part of it that he can control. The outcome is, is out of control. But if I don't control that, the process along the way, then I have no chance that the outcome is complete luck. Um, and then there are some, some physical adjustments. There's some physical adjustments, some mentality adjustments. He has to be able to, to cover the top of the strike zone on fastball timing first and then work down the strike zone from there. Oftentimes you would see him work from the bottom of the strike zone up, um, almost like that's where I want the ball because I want it down. I'm more comfortable to pitch down and then I'll work down to up. And so then you consistently get a, a, a flared, a flared uh, contact point or a soft contact point to, to the right side of the field for him. Um, and, and then consistently beat with fastballs in or fastballs up and fastballs up and out. And being able to really get him to trust, like I can cover the top of the strike zone first and then work down into my comfort zone. I have the time to do that. So I would say th those two major things have, uh, have been an adjustment for him through his time with us. John and then Tom. Tommy Somer, uh, it seems like, you know, there's been a early <laughs> control issue sometimes at the beginning of games, but then once he settles down, everything else has been great. So, I mean, how much have you identify what's going wrong early in games uh, and then what it has impressed you about what he's been able to do and the rest of the innings that he's had to be able to obviously have like 12 strikeouts um, last weekend. Well, Tom, Tommy's the, 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 the consummate, the, 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 the consummate problem solver where th that is the great thing about him. Yes. The, the start of the game against Purdue was, was not terrific, but you trust Tommy to figure it out, whatever the issue is, you know, he talked about this past weekend about not, it was, it was super windy and it felt like the ball was really slick and really dry. It's like, I just couldn't get a grip of the ball. It's like, all right, well, let's make sure the next weekend you bring the rosin bag out with you when you start the game. Like we had two guys into the rosin bag to start the ball game. It's like, let's just bring it with us when we come out to the mound next week. It's like, we all kind of laugh about it and, and we'll go from there. But, um, you know, I, I think obviously the beginning of the game, you're, you're excited, you're, you're, the emotions run high and you have to be able to settle in to kind of get into the, kind of get in the groove of things. And, and, and Tommy, 
Tommy has good stuff. Like Tommy has good stuff. He's not going to throw 97 miles an hour. And so he, he's got to really, he's got to really be able to pitch and locate and, and manipulate the ball. Sometimes when you're excited, it's a little harder to manipulate the ball that way. And it's different when, you know, when, when Matt Litwick, when Matt, when Matt Litwick, comes in throwing a hundred miles an hour, he could just pour diesel down the middle of the plate. And Tommy's going to have to be able to work the ball to both sides of the plate, four different pitches. And, and that just takes a little more feel and he, he's got to settle in, which, which he always does. And, 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 and you feel good about those things, but. I think probably a little bit of a separate issues. I know this past weekend, this, he felt like the ball was really dry and slick. And once he was able to get a grip of it and feel better, then he, he kind of settled in and pitched from there. Tom, and then Austin? Jeff, I want to ask you sort of an advanced scouting question on teams. I honestly don't know the answer to this. I mean, how do you guys go about uh, scouting, like, say, Michigan State this weekend? And, you know, and uh, you know, where do you, where do you get your knowledge from and, and how do you put your game plans together with that in, in – Big Ten baseball these days? It's a great question. Uh, we have a, a program called Synergy that has all of the all the video from uh, the uh, opponent's previous games on there, all the statistics, uh, all the, the, the in real time video of their previous games and they're cutting the clips. <laughs> so in the, you know, in the past, in the old days, we would, you know, he would email uh, the, the previous opponent. So let's say, let's say like we played Michigan State this weekend, you would email this is when we had non-conference because in conference, you kind of have a handshake agreement. You don't share in conference, but let's say they played somebody else out of conference. They played uh, uh, Wright State. Well, I'd email Wright State and say, hey, what'd you think? What was your report? And then they would send us their report. We would trade a report. It's different now where for us anyway, I would just rather our coaches watch the games and make their own scouting report. I just trust our guys better. So Justin will watch Michigan State's all of their at-bats from the season. He'll watch all that and then put together the scouting report based on his evaluation of them personally. And then he'll call pitches based on, obviously, all of that. And the from a, from a defensive standpoint, Justin calls the pitches, but he also – we have basic – we have basic structural defensive shifts to begin an at-bat. And then based on pitch to pitch that he's calling, then we can shift a step off of that. So I'll shift the outfielders based on the pitch call – and then he and Derek will shift the infielders based off the pitch call, uh, based off of all the video he's watched. And then Derek, uh, Derek and Josh Chernock will watch all of the, the, the opposing pitchers. And then Derek will put together all of the scouting ports for the, for the opposing pitchers that are coming up. Uh, pitch selection, zone locations, pitch profiles, spin profiles. So every, every pitch that, that, every pitcher that comes in, once you have enough information off of TrackMan, I'll have all the spin profiles, all the pitch deviations, vertically, horizontally, uh, uh, count selections, all that stuff going into the weekend. And then we can watch the video for the hitters. But most of that's done in-house now through our department. In the past, it was kind of relying on somebody else. And no offense to anybody else, I would, I would just rather rely on our guys than, than, than somebody else. But it, it is a, it's a ton of intensive work that goes into it for the week. Austin and then John. Coach, you talk about sometimes you learn the most from a loss or from some struggles. What did you guys learn from the loss on Saturday that you can use going forward? Well, I think it was the same lessons that we had learned earlier in the year from a, from an offensive standpoint. But sometimes it it's just been, not sometimes this year has been a, a goofy situation where I'm out. I'm not able to be in there and help some of those guys. In real time, and Derek and Dan are doing a great job, but it's just that they're wearing 10 different hats uh, during those times. So I, I think that the similar things from an offensive standpoint that we just have to be able to adjust through. Um, you look at not having Justin there this weekend, obviously was was impactful from a, a pitch selection standpoint. Um, we, we didn't play as, as good defense as we have played. Part of that is not having the, 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 the shift alignments precisely where you're going to want them at when you have – one person, we have a coach calling the pitches and everyone else is shifting based off of those pitch selections. So, you know, we had an opportunity to win those games, both offensively on the mound and defensively in all three phases of the game weren't good enough to be able to pull that out. But you did see some of those, some of those symptoms in other games, um, but we were able to be so terrific in one of the other or two of the other areas that it overcame that. Normally it had been, we were so terrific defensively and, and, and on the mound that it overcame a lack of offense or, or, or what have you to, to win those games. So 
I think it was a it was a it was a eye opening experience for the for the pitchers. Like we you want to play professional baseball, you're going to have to, be able to call your own game. You're going to have to, be able to manage your own game a little bit, um, and making sure that we are where we need to be in our in our in our preparation and understanding an opponent. And again, it's a it's a really goofy situation where all of a sudden you know two hours before the game, your your pitching coach who calls every pitch is out, and I understand that's that's hard. And and, and Dan's jumping in, and those guys are trying to really help, but. Um, it's it's the importance of preparation. It's the importance of applying a game plan. So, Austin, to your point, I do think it is a positive thing where you, you say, hey, success is fragile. Winning is fragile. Uh, it's hard. And, and it, the, the chain can be broken far more easily than I think than sometimes we understand it can. And um, that obviously was evident this weekend and, and we weren't good enough. So you have to apply and learn and grow and improve. And, and, and humility is part of that process. And, and obviously, I think that we have that. All right, John, and then we'll wrap up with Carl. <clears throat> Talked about Matt Lewicki earlier, just a guy who can pour diesel, you know, down the zone. I mean, is it, when you were identifying someone who could pitch that ninth inning, I mean, was that one of those factors? Like, what what were the factors that went into, like, this is a guy we think can be a closer? And, and what you've seen so far, has he kind of nailed that down, or are you still maybe thinking about trying other guys at some point? I would say at this point he secured that job um, – you know, the, the, the reality with, with Matt is he's been, a, 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 I want to say a work in progress, but a continuing growth throughout. And, and it really only, has only become the last, probably the last month or so that, that, that he really has become the player that he is now. He, he's obviously always been talented. He's thrown hard, uh, but obviously not this hard. Um, he, he's thrown hard in the past. They, you know, the, 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 the pitching staff and Matt have worked really hard to, 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 to use the pitch profile that he has best, right? Was, is it a four seam? Is it a two seam? Is it a two seam and a slider? Like, what is it? Like, what are his spin rates? What is, what's his arm slot? Like, what, are they, what does it dictate that he does best? And, and so they're able to really hone in on that this past year. Uh, and then just the continued work in the weight room and the continued development physically. I mean, he is a strong young man. I mean, just, he's a bull. Uh, and, you know, he's gained a lot of weight, a lot of strength and kept his mobility. And so, you know, he was this fall, he was probably 92, 95, 93, 96, somewhere in that range. You know, this winter, all of a sudden it was like, hey, Matt touched 97 a few times. It's like he just keeps getting stronger and stronger. Um, and then that first weekend, it's like, did you guys know Matt was up to 99? It's like, you're kidding me. Um, and then I get I get reports this weekend, he touched 99 multiple times in both outings and and so it really has been a continued growth uh, uh, for him. And it really has just kind of all come together for him in the last month. Um, and and I, I could not be happier for, for anybody than I am for Matt. I mean, he has worked. He came in, had Tommy John, obviously before we were here, but he had Tommy John, the work that he put in, and he was freshman year was a struggle as it is for everybody who has an injury and is out. Um, and, and he just worked and worked and worked and, and is just, really invested himself. So to see him have the success that he's had, obviously is, is great for the team. The team's excited when it's like, oh, it's like Matt's getting up. It's like, you know, you just, when you have a great closer, and we've had a couple of them through our time coaching where it's like the, the game's over uh, and everyone gets excited to get the ball to that guy. Um, and you can feel the energy of uh, that with Matt. Um, but I'm also really excited for him personally because he's just an awesome kid who has worked he is the he is the poster child for for investment and hard work uh, paying off and and he's earned it. He has earned the right to be as good as he is. All right, wrap us up, Carl. Yes, Coach. Uh, if you could just talk a little bit about uh, Ty Bothwell and his uh, versatility, the fact that uh, he, he had you know, great outings as a starter and in this shorter series a great outing as a reliever. Yeah, you talk about Matt uh, earning the right to be successful. Ty is uh, the epitome of that as well. You know, he's he's gotten so much stronger. He's, he's so much more uh, durable, both physically and, and mentally and emotionally. Uh, and I think that's what allows him to have great success. His stuff is good, but you have you have to have a, a toughness and an awareness and a durability to say, okay, I'm a starter. I'm a reliever. What am I going to be? It's like, hey, listen, what you're going to be today is what we need what we need you to be to win. So you might start and you might come out of the bullpen. I'm not sure when it's going to be, just be ready to go. And that's where Ty has become much more resilient. Um, and I think that it's, that's a, that's a character statement because that, 
his stuff is good enough to win. There's a lot of guys whose stuff is good enough to win, but do you have the mentality? To, to, do you do you have what it takes to be able to to handle that moment? And, and he does. So uh, Ty's done a terrific job, and he's going to be an incredibly important piece for us. There's going to be four game weekends where obviously he's the odds on favorite to start that fourth game. He's going to continue to push our three weekend starters. Uh, because he has something that that's incredibly valuable, which is a fastball that's hard to hit. When you can get swings and misses consistently on your fastball, it just makes you so valuable. So the guys that start on the weekends, they, they, they always, in a good way, you have to be looking over your shoulder because Ty and a couple of those guys are, are always kind of on your heels. And, and, and that's a good thing to have competition, just like the position players have competition. Um, but having that versatility out of the pen is a huge deal as well. Um, and obviously, if you have a chance to play in the postseason, having a guy like that that can do both is, is a really big deal when you're trying to play multiple games in a, in, in a day and multiple games in a weekend back to back. And having that guy is huge. So very, very proud of Ty. And, and talk about a guy that's worked his tail off. That guy's he's worked like a maniac to, to make himself the player that he is. All right. Thank you, Coach Mercer. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it so much. It's good to see everybody. Hope Thanks, Coach. Thank you.